Greetings, folks. Welcome to another episode of The Transcendence, uh, brought to you by the Swedenborg Foundation. I'm your host, Corey Bradford Watts, and I'm here with uh, our wonderful guest, Gord Alton. Uh, greetings, Gord. Thanks to be here. Gord, tell me a little bit about yourself. What, what uh, professions, what titles do you hold in this life right now? Well, I actually wear sort of three different hats, I guess you would say. Um, I'm a pastor of a Mennonite church here at Mannheim Mennonite Church. I'm a, a pastoral counselor and trainer, uh, supervisor, educator for uh, Canadian Association of Spiritual Care. I'm a provisional supervisor right now in training. And I train students right here at the church, so the church frees up time for me to do that. And I'm also a private practice uh, spiritual director. So three different hats I wear right now. Oh, that's that's wonderful. It sounds like pretty pretty heavy hats in a way. <laughs> it's busy and it's but it's quite rich. Yeah, quite rich. Well, just for full disclosure, uh, I know you particularly through the spiritual direction path. You're uh, my spiritual director right now. How how am I doing now? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just beginning, Corey. We yeah. want to with each other when Four or five times. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of the theme of this webcast, Transcendia. It's not int. It's uh, like almost like idiot, but with transcend. Oh, beginning. I see. I see. Trying to, to overcome some of our, uh, our our more lower tendencies, you could say. Okay. Well, I I appreciate your work and, and for being on this uh, broadcast. Thank you. So, where are we now? We're, we're at your church. Well, you're actually at this, the back of my sanctuary here at the Manheim Mennonite Church. It's a small church around, now it's about probably 40, 50 people on a Sunday morning. It's a small group of about 30, 35 people at the full house yeah. of the people here. So, it's a very small church. It's 10, 50 years ago, that was way larger. It was over you know, like 100 people or more back in those days. It seems to be the case around... Good group? Yes, very caring group, very committed. If they weren't committed, this church wouldn't be here today, so it's commendable. Huh. Are you the only pastor in this church? Yes, I am actually three quarter time pastor here, and, and then one third of that time, a quarter time, is given towards education purposes for, my church, for the other training I do. Oh, yeah. Well, tell us about y your path to those hats um, and, and how you, you came to to do such uh, tremendous work? Yeah. Well, my first career was not actually pastoring or ministry at all. It was computers. Oh, yeah. I'm a, a computer geek. I uh, went to University of Waterloo in the Bachelor of Mathematics program. Yeah. It was a CS option and graduated from there and worked um, in Canada Trust for four years in London. Um, huh. So that's where I began. It had nothing to do with religion or spirituality at all. We have similar backgrounds. Uh, I, I went to school for computer science and worked in finance. I went to school for finance too. But what was that like for you working in those realms? Oh, I enjoyed it. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, I had stuffy skills in those areas. Um, and that, what caused the shift for me was I had an experience during my university years. Oh. Uh, mystical experience, and due to that mystical experience, all of a sudden God became real for me. Very real, rather than just a belief oriented, it was, a, it was a more of a spiritual way. And I began to experience God more daily, seeing signs of God's spirit at work. And that experience created a shift. And so when I was, that happened during the university days. And so I went to Canada Trust. I was already looking for things which brought more meaning than just normal work. And after four years at Canada Trust, I realized. I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to do something rather than bring money to the bottom line of a company. Yeah. I wanted to do something which brought meaning to people's lives, including my own. And, and I was really curious about this experience I had um, that created the shift. Like, what happened? Like, what was that all about? Um, and so my journey ever since then has been trying to understand spirituality and how God's spirit connects with people and how that happens, how growth happens. And how that connects with the everyday world. Wow, that's that's really cool. That you know, such a 
experience sent you on a trajectory of, of reflection and growth and trying to support other people in their, their spiritual growth. Can I, can I ask, and you can share as much as you want, uh, what was that experience? Well, for me, it was uh, a time in my university years where I was really struggling in the sense relationship-wise. Uh, caught in a bit of a love triangle and not feeling good about it, and but also struggling at school. Was, you know, when you're in high school, I was an A student. At university, I was a B, C student. I struggled with that. Mm -hmm. So those things together, and then failing my first work term didn't help. I would, I would get co-op at the University of Waterloo, and I, and I failed. It didn't count towards graduation. So all those different aspects, I think, put me in a place where I was really struggling emotionally. And I realized I needed help. And so I remember one, it was a September night, it's 1980, probably three, I guess it was, where I basically, well, I need help. I can't do this on my own. And I just turned to God. I, and up to then, I was, you know, I was I had a faith, which was, I grew up in the United Church. So I had a faith, which was very based on catechism. And like I had gone to church, I had all my stickers, you know, all the things that make a good United Church Christian, you know, and and yet God wasn't real for me. It was just an idea, right? A belief. And so that night, I actually pleaded to God to prove to God to me that He was real, what? real, because I needed something real in my life, not just a belief, but something real. And and so that was my prayer. You know, I need your help, God. Please show me that you're real and that you care for me. And I remember shedding some tears that night. And the next morning, I woke up and I began looking for signs that, that my prayer might be answered. And and I started seeing signs of God's sort of spirit here and there and almost speaking to me. Um, you go into a movie and, and and the movie hits you and you're like, wow, there's that teaching. And it, everything just seemed to connect and Incredible. come alive. It was like it became magical for a while. And and that just caught me off guard. And and also that sense of um, what you say, uh, guilt piece, you know, the shame piece that are lifted for that. And so I was really in a really good space and place in my faith. And then probably, what was it, a month, two months later, I met the person who I married. <laughs> and I had a sense ahead of time, like a, a precognition pre that I was going to meet someone special this weekend, a retreat That's weekend amazing. for young adults. And I turned out I met that person. And uh, and did I eventually, eventually marry him. So there was a lot of things that sort of came together. Then, and in my life since then has had a lot of these sort of type of experiences where I just... I had to say, wow, God made that happen. That door open. This door open. Hmm. And as a result, it just makes me even more curious. What is driving this whole path that I'm on? And not just my path, but I think this can be true for other people. What is driving all this? Where is God's spirit in the midst of all this? And so that has been my journey ever since. That's incredible. Yeah. Do you find that if people are looking for God, God often will speak to them as they did, as God did with you? I think there's truth in that. I think it's, part of it is the seeking. Mm. Part of it is also the seeking has to put you in a place of surrendering too. It, it, you can't be grasping for God because I think when you're trying to grasp God, I think you're trying to control God. And so the grasping piece, actually, I spent a lot of work trying to help people soften the grasping. Like seeking and longing is really important. I think that's what pulls us towards God and experiencing God. But when we want to you know, grasp and control what we're seeking, that's when that that action, that posture, I think gets in the way of it. And as a result, I think people get really frustrated when they're in that place. And so that's, oh, yeah. I think that's the difference, yeah. is that whole longing, that seeking, the curiosity piece, um, the surrendering piece. Once you're moving, moving along those type of postures, you start seeing things. You mm -hmm. start because now you're open to receiving. When you're grasping, you can't receive. You're because you're looking for something in a particular way, a particular experience. It's kind of like testing God in a sense. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, in a sense. For me, it it, it reminds me of Christ's temptation to um, essentially. Have God prove that God is there, ready to save them. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know many of us believe Christ is God, but in the story, the devil's tempting Jesus in the wilderness mm -hmm. around that. And 
it sounds similar because I feel like when I'm grasping for God, trying to kind of force God's presence into a situation, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, prove you're around or do my bidding. And right. It doesn't really work. Well, and in that, and then in the temptation story, it's actually at the end where, where God or Jesus resists the devil, right? At the end, when he starts, let's, let's go, all of a sudden we see the angels come and minister to Jesus. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? It's not in the midst of it. It's in the midst of it, we hear him, he hears certain truths, which again is from him listening, but it's not him grasping for those truths. Yeah. And it's only at the end when he basically, he's by himself, that all of a sudden he's in a place of total surrender and all of a sudden, he feels ministered to by all the angels of God. Hmm. You mentioned curiosity and longing being an essential part of, of your walk and, and what you, you feel um, is a space that God can really uh, present uh, himself, herself. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that right? Could you, could you uh, explore that a little more? I'm curious about curiosity and how that works well curiosity for me has almost become like a fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. in the sense that when we're curious our mind is totally open because we're we're, we're we're open to understand what this is what that is so that curiosity just keeps us in a place of reception and god can speak to us in that place mm -hmm. right just like um just like longing in the heart is the same thing except, it's, except now it's from the heart place the heart is longing to receive something it touches the heart, or the curiosity, the mind's longing to receive something that touches the mind and wets and fills that curiosity. Mm -hmm. So curiosity and longing are very much, are, are really two parts of the journey of, of following and really experiencing God. It's kind of like head, wisdom, is yeah. curiosity, and heart, love. Is mm -hmm. Well, I would say probably heart, heart is probably more around desire. Desire. Desire and the longing comes from the gut. Longing is from the gut. The gut. Mm -hmm. you know, the sense of longing for connection, longing to trust, longing to to really settle and be at peace and not be anxious huh. and be grounded. So the longings come from the gut, desires from the heart, and the curiosity is from the mind. And those three things together, I think, pull us along the pathway to experiencing God mm -hmm. and the fullness of God's kingdom. Well, you see it a lot today, this longing, I think, for peace. And we, we see a lot of folks turning to meditation and other um, practices that help bring them into the present moment. And it sounds like that's a, a key part of what you're describing in terms of how we can relate to God and find divinity in our life. Mm -hmm. Well, those spiritual practices is all about helping people become very centered in the present moment. It's in the present moment that we encounter our curiosity, that we encounter our desires of the heart, that we encounter our longings. Mm -hmm. And those longings, desires, and care pull us in into the experience of God in the moment, whether it be insight or whether it be a, an image for the, the mind captures or whether it be a bit of a vision or a dream. Or for the heart, it's, it's, it's a sense of compassion that begins to rise as you notice the pain around you or within yourself, or the sense of joy, and the signs of spring all around us. Or it's a gut, it's that longing, longing for peace and justice, or the longing for to really, you know, feel it connected with someone deeply. You know, um, so you don't have to to be worried uh, about life. It's, it's, it's a longing that things will work out. Those longings pull us. Into the, into the path, I could say, that takes us home to be with God. Well, yeah, so some of these feelings, these, these things that some people um, may find or feel like they're grappling with, they're not sure what to do with, or if it's even helpful, that, that kind of call um, you're saying is, is really a way that God can pull us closer. He's, these desires for, mm -hmm. for really for to, to let go of some of the things that are yeah. making us anxious. Well, really, every experience in life is designed to bring us home. Mm. Like we often focus on the positive experiences in life, you know, love yeah. and joy and compassion, all that. But it, I think the negative experiences 
had more just as much potential to pull draws home as the, the positive ones. Mm-hmm. Because the negative ones, you, there's a sense that you know there's something not right here, right? Yeah. And and that's what what's the curiosity? Well, what's not right here? And you know, and 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 the heart is really sitting there. Okay, what what? And the heart desires to know what's not right here. And so, like my work, we in spirit direction, we learn to hold every single experience, whether it be anger, hatred, guilt, shame, depression, every experience. And I see every one of them as a gateway to coming home, as a doorway to coming home. The key is is how to hold those experiences in a way which allows them to open up, so that God can speak to us. To the, in those experiences, hmm. to see how depression is really a sign of something within us is blocking our ability to really feel alive in the moment. It could be a trust issue. It could be a sense of fear going on that, that shuts us down. Like there's many things which are behind depression, which cause us to contract, which is why we're depressed. The energy within us is not allowed to flow, and so as we become really curious and begin to explore what is behind. This contraction, which is coming, kind of feels depressed. All of a sudden, that becomes a doorway to us discovering the truth that's needed to set us free to a place where depression is less part of our life. Huh. Would you say that posture of, of uh, letting letting yourself be drawn towards divinity and um, and noticing what things are kind of keeping the energy from flowing is that a key part of what you're trying to uplift in your spiritual uh, direction? Or? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I spend as much time focusing on the positive as I do on the negative. Like I, the negative to me is just, it's just as important. In fact, it's even I think even more important because the negative helps me helps me become aware of and also the direct you become aware of the things in our life which are blocking the flow of God's spirit. Like whether it be love, whether it be compassion, whether it be strength, God's power, God's joy, mm-hmm. God's inner support. The negative experience helps us know where the blocks are within our soul. And by blocks, I mean, you know, I mean those, those beliefs which are caught and can be very fixed. By blocks, I mean those, those behavior patterns we've learned from our past, which get in the way of us actually having a deep relationship with ourselves or God and others. By blocks, I mean some of the patterns we have and how we deal with them we'll hold our emotions. Oh, I shouldn't cry, so we shut it down. Hmm. Well, we can't cry. We can't experience God's compassion because tears and God's compassion are right beside each other. They're very much connected. And so if we have a block within us that keeps us from crying, like Dad said, is you know, boys never cry. Then when we're a man, we're gonna find it very, very hard to experience the tenderness and the softness and the tears of compassion in life toward ourselves or towards others. That's the block. And so in spiritual direction, we're all about how do we work through that? How do we how do I help a person begin to explore the blocks which get in the way of them having tears? Hmm. I remember this past year I had a Buddhist student, you know, and tears is something that was very foreign to her. She was brought to believe tears is not part of a part of her tradition, and yet compassion is such a big part of Buddhism. Hmm. Right. And I remember exploring that with her, and now after working with her a year, now she's in touch with her tears, she's in touch with her other feelings, and they no longer scare her. They actually help her connect to the tears of others. So now she she's become a really good psychotherapist um, with other people, including you know, whether it be Buddhist or Christian. Because now she's able to be with her tears. She's able to be with a lot of the negative emotions, which often are seen as issues in Buddhism, but they're not. They're not really. They're just blocks. Blocks to experiencing the fullness of reality in the Buddhist tradition. You know, um, yeah. That's incredible. It's. I feel like it's a, it's a high calling to try to uplift um, this kind of health in, in folks. I'm curious though about some some more of the details along your journey. So you had this experience. And yeah, there's a lot of things that led me to this place. <laughs> yeah. um, when I uh, finished my seminary in, uh, in 1993, I moved into the Markham Stillway area. Uh, to be a pastor there, and it was only a 60% position, so I had to find something else. And so I began to look around, and I, th- I actually, another part of my story is that I lost two brothers to HIV AIDS. Oh, they, were, they were hemophiliacs. They, were, they, were, got, they took blood products during the 1980s, 70s and 80s, and as you know, the blood products in both U.S. Canada got contaminated due to the virus. Well, 
during the 90s, my brothers died. And, but because of that experience, I was drawn to get involved in the AIDS community of region. And, and they were just forming, and I was part of the founding committee that helped start it. And I began a support group, a AIDS support group. And so I remember the next three, four years, I ran a support group out of my church down in Markham, Hager Mennonite, Hager Mennonite Church. And that group met every, well, I think I met every, at least every month, for sure, if not every two weeks. Well, that led to many funerals and visitations. I did a lot of visiting with people with HIV AIDS in the city or their families. And that work led to me being invited to be a pastoral counselor for what was called then the, K the Community Care Access Center of York Region. It was a community-based healthcare organization connected to the government, providing health care to the community. And they saw me work with the AIDS committee and they wanted That's me to go forward. Could you come and join us? We would like to offer chaplaincy. Pastor counseling to the community for people with palliative care and mental health. Mm -hmm. And so in 1996, that became my second part of my journey. Or the, I was in the church, and now I was doing ministry in the community, visiting people in their homes around chaplaincy, pastoral counseling, and health. Well, that's quite the milestone, quite the work. It was. And I still remember one of my earliest clients. She was in her 50s. She was living with cancer. She was palliative. And she invited me to come see her, and her question to me at the end of my visit, first visit was, Gord, can you teach me how to pray? And I sat there and I said to myself, hmm, I know she's not asking me to teach her the Lord's Prayer. She's actually asking me to teach her how to develop a relationship with God and feel close to God in the midst of her illness. And I realized that I had not learned that at seminary. You know, at seminary you learn about theology and biblical studies and languages and how to preach and pastoral care, basic pastoral care, but there was really not a focus on how to help people develop and deepen their relation with God. So that's what sent me back to get some training to be a spiritual director. Because that's really what spiritual direction is all about, is how to help people develop and deepen a relation with God, by focusing on their prayer practices, and focusing on the things in life which just getting away, getting in the way of their God relationship, feeling close to God. And so that was a huge shift for me, and I mm -hmm. loved it. Just loved it. But now I was getting into, into psychology a little bit and seeing how psychology and spirituality was connecting together and seeing how it connects to the God relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's what sent you to spiritual direction. So spiritual direction. And I got that training and I was really enjoying that. And so I said, okay, I want to go deeper with this. Okay. <laughs> so I, that's how I got involved in the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care. They have a, a whole a extensive training program to be pastoral counselors. And so I became part of the, I did that for some extra training every year for, for four years um, to get my certification as a pastoral counselor specialist. Hmm. And, and that training was really interesting. Because here I was, you know, in spiritual direction, I had some psychology and spirituality and we were integrated. But when I went into the, into the CAS program, here I was learning all the psychology, you know, all the different models of psychotherapy, individual, family psychotherapy, and so on. But the connection to spirituality was really, really weak. Hmm. We would do some theological reflection at the end of the day, but it didn't answer my question. So how can I join God's spirit in the midst of a counseling session? and support it wherever it wants to go. That was the question I came to pastoral counseling with, which is what we do in spiritual direction. But that's not how we do, that's not how they train pastoral counselors. And so I remember getting my certification, but at the end of the day, I was really, I was frustrated. Although there were a couple of models at the very end, I, I discovered focusing, which is a way of how to learn, listen to the felt sense within the body, which to me had some strong connections to spirituality. But beyond that, um, I came out of that training program with more questions than answers. <laughs> and, and so you... So I kept searching. <laughs> <laughs> I kept searching. And I took a sabbatical, actually, uh, from church for three four months to actually work at the search because I wanted to do some research regarding how does psychology and spirituality come together. It okay. clearly didn't come together in my training. So I took three, four months and did some research and reading, and, and that's when I discovered the Diamond Approach, which is a psychological school 
geared towards helping people work at their personal spiritual formation. Um, and it uses psychology to work at the, at the question of spirituality, how to nurture the soul and the different aspects of the soul. And so they don't use the word God in language, they use, their word is essence and the different essential qualities or the qualities of essence. But as I was part of the school, it became very quick to, like, for me, it became very apparent that, boy, some of these terms they're using can map onto our, some of our Christian terms, you know, essence, God, essential qualities, fruits of the spirit. I saw a lot of interconnection, potential for integration. It's interesting how we, we often have different terms for similar things. And mm -hmm. We may hold baggage towards the ones we don't use, but we often kind of relate to yeah. uh, similar aspects. And so I became oh. part of the school, as, and it, it was fascinating, they were starting a school in Toronto, a Toronto um, Diamond Pro School in Toronto. And so I joined it the very first first week, and I, <laughs> I've been there, been with it ever since. I mean, it involves two, three retreats every year, I've been part of the school now for oh, 13 years now. But it's interesting because it, for me, it really helped me see some connections in ways I never saw before. It helped me you know, see how all the fruits of the Spirit, you know, like compassion, joy, strength, trust, inner support, truth or insight, like all the fruits are available to everyone. They're at, they're at the core ingredient of the human soul at birth, and they're there all the time. The issue is that due to our the way we've been raised, the way we've been nurtured, we develop many blocks, or what we call ego structures in the diamond approach, which get in the way of the flow of these things developing. Mm. Like I mentioned how, you know, if, if we weren't given permission for tears and sadness, well, we would have a hard time experiencing compassion. Because those beliefs, those, those ego structures that we develop from our childhood get in the way of us experiencing tears and compassion and the softness and the tenderness that arises from experiencing compassion. And you, you've mentioned like habits that we often develop when we're young to, mm -hmm. to help us get through hard times or you know unperfect uh, situations. And often we yeah we want to heal from you know and, and, as, and as kids, you know, we needed those structures. Yeah. The, they were so the, they were survival patterns, strategies, right? We you know, if, if you weren't given permission to cry, you learned quickly not to cry, but it wasn't safe. Your life was at stake, right? The same with anger. How many kids, when they're two years old, you know, you know, the angry twos, you know, stubborn, rebellious, no. Yeah. Well, how many parents hold that really well in a way which kids learn to really understand that anger is actually a good thing rather than a bad thing? Hmm. Right? Most of us is, oh, anger's bad. <laughs> Gotta shut her down. Well, that anger... And the down approach is actually a doorway into experiencing God's strength. So we can't be with anger. Really? It's going to be really hard for us to be with, experience deeply God's strength. And that's so, it. So the down approach helped me see all the ways our different emotions are connected to the spiritual fruits or the, the essential qualities of essence. And you realize, wow, all these structures are really the barriers to how people experience God. Yeah. So... We, we needed them as kids. They were survival strategies. That's how we managed this and, tr and thrived as best we could. But as adults, they get in the way of us experiencing God. Hmm. And so my goal as a spirit director is, okay, how can I help people? Well, first discover what are the barriers that's getting in the way of their flow of God's spirit and then to unpack that and to really whet their curiosity and longing for that deeper connection. And that often limits our creativity, like coming up with new words like unperfect. No. <laughs> Words that we, we don't necessarily need. Uh, I, I love how you put that, that really we all are relating to divinity through those positive qualities in our lives and our spirit. Um, and, and there's structures that somewhat keep us from yeah. connecting with God. But we may not even call those things God, and yet we could have a very deep relationship with that, sure. that higher power. Yeah. yeah. Like anxiety. How many of us experience anxiety? We all do. Well, what causes anxiety? Well, anxiety is because we're not able to experience trust in the moment. Yeah. So that tells you there's something in the way that's blocking the flow of trusting God in the moment. Hmm. There's your structure. Well, how do we work at that? So the experience of anxiety points to where the path is for healing. 
Yeah. It does. Yeah. Right? And so you're like, okay, so let's breathe into anxiety. Let's begin to understand anxiety. Let's be really curious about it. Because anxiety is a longing for you to experience trust. Hmm. And as we unpack it, all of a sudden we get in touch with some of the memories and the stories. And they begin to experience God's presence in the midst of what broke that trust. And the trust begins to be healed and restored. And often it does seem to involve like reflecting on your history. Yeah. Maybe even like a deep history that you don't quite, you may not even be able to remember exactly. Well, this is probably one of the differences of the diamond approach to other spiritual paths is a lot of spiritual paths is about trying to transcend the negative experiences. Like transcendence. Well, I don't know <laughs> about that. <laughs> I don't know about transcendence. <laughs> you but said I, the word I had to. <laughs> trying to get a connection. But anyway, but a lot of paths is about trying to transcend those negative experiences. Yeah. Rise above your anger. Rise above your anxiety. Rise above your depression. Right? And you can rise above it, but when that rise, when you begin to relax and let go, you fall back, often back into those difficult experiences again. Yeah. It doesn't actually transform those experiences. It transcends it, but doesn't transform. Yeah. And the only way to transform those experiences is actually to go into them, which is really why I like the diamond approach, because it stresses you can't transcend. The only way you can transform is by actually going into and allowing God's Spirit to minister in this place. Rather than depression, anxiety, and for you to discover the truth you need to understand, such that transformation can happen. And that's what creates the shifts. And these shifts are more permanent then. Meaning that you your sense of anxiety begins to become less part of your life. So you could redefine transcendence to be more like a transformation. Because you would think a true transcendence would be uh, sustainable, right? But totally. often we think of transcendence as just kind of escaping. Right. But you're saying that's not it. You have to go, no. go in. True transcendence is really transformation at the bottom, mm -hmm. which then changes everything that's built upon. Yeah. Right. That's true transcendence, if you want to say it that way. So if we, yeah, well, we often have different terms for things. So. Right. Um, yeah, thank you for relating it that way. If we were to try to transcend judgment or, or transform judgment. We couldn't just let it go necessarily. We want to reflect on where our, our sense of judgment towards other people, towards ourselves comes from. Right. Um, look at the heart of the affection. Well, and more. for judgment, judgment to me is a sign, is one of the terms in the Bible that uses hard-heartedness. Oh. Right. right? So judgment is really a, a reflection of a heart being hard. So what? So what's causing the heart to be hard? That's what I'm curious about, hmm. right? Well, a hard heart is a heart that cannot feel to compassion. So what's blocking that compassion? Because if you had compassion, you wouldn't be judgmental toward that person, hmm. right? So I'm curious what blocks the compassion. Hmm. And in the diamond approach, the relationship between what blocks compassion is tied to tied to our relationship with pain. Hmm. If you don't like pain or we hate pain, we will shut down when pain comes up, and we will judge whatever causes us to feel pain. We will lose our compassion. So we do a lot of work around our relationship with pain. Sounds interesting. Pain caused by a person who's hurt me, so that means we're getting into forgiveness issues. Mm -hmm. Or pain caused by the fact that life's really unfair to me, and so therefore I'm so upset with God right now because this shouldn't have happened, this is unfair. Those are all expressions of pain. And our relationship with that pain determines how it determines how we hold that pain and also how we can be healed from it. Wow. And if we, can't, if we can't be with the pain, then our compassion will shut down and we will be judgmental toward anyone who touches that pain spot in our life, whatever that is. So learning to be with the pain can be helpful. And, and allowing God's Spirit to minister to that pain. Wow. So compassion can arise and you begin to understand the truth of Mm. What it really needs for that pain to actually subside, be soothed, feel it. Well, often judgment seems to come um, from you know, folks that we, we don't necessarily agree with. Like we, we feel a judgment towards mm -hmm. people who have different religions or different traditions or worldviews. Um, and, and it seems like a lot of the pain that comes from that is this this kind of defensiveness around our own intellect or ideas. 
Right. But it can have these deeper roots too, mm-hmm. as well. It sounds like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think it's really, really important to be really curious about what causes us to judge people. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I, I've always been taken by the story of the um, the two trees in the Garden of Eden in Genesis two and three. Yeah. One's a tree of life. You eat from this tree, you experience life. And the other tree is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, you experience what? Judgment. You become a judging person. What happens when Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge? Do they experience nakedness as just nakedness? No, nakedness is now wrong. Yeah, they judge themselves. It's now wrong. And wrong. so, and, and, and now the relation with God, is this now seen as neutral? It's just God just says, no, no, now they're nervous of God. They believe God is now judging them. Project, they project the good evil onto God, and now God's judging as evil good or evil. We have to be careful, we have to be careful here. All because we're eating from the wrong tree. When we eat from the tree of life, there is no judgment. There's truth, yes. But truth is very different than knowledge of good evil. Well, when something is true, like when somebody says, oh, this is a really good experience. This brings life to me. Our, when we say that, are we, is that, a, is that a judgment or is that just an experience right in the home? Mm-hmm. We're not making any comparison. Well, this is a good piece of pie, but that's a bad piece of pie. No, that's a good piece of pie. It tastes really good. It's awesome. There is no comparison going on. Mm-hmm. Or something, there's time, I remember uh, talking, we had a discussion recently about this whole issue of good and evil. You know, the Awanda experience, the genocide. That is an evil experience. We all agree it's evil. <clears throat> but it's, what makes it evil? What's evil because it destroys life. It's not evil because we're comparing it to something which is good. It's just evil in itself. But well, what, what I want you to be curious about is what caused that experience of evil? It was caused by a group of people who said, they are the enemy. They judged, and we're not. And they get, we got to get rid of the enemy. And that's eating the tree of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Huh. Judging good and evil, get rid of evil. When you're eating from the tree of life, you're not doing that. You're experiencing goodness, it's goodness. You're experiencing evil, is but there is no comparison going on. And that truth becomes your guiding. That truth sets us free, as the Bible says. Truth in that way. There is no good and evil in this in, 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 in a comparative sense. And I think that is so free. And so when I, like, that's why I don't judge any experience as good or evil and accounts in my spiritual direction on this. We're focusing, what is the truth of it? What is it trying to show us? That's a very different question. Because you're willing to identify something as destructive, but you're still looking for the truth of it. Like, what the truth of it. Because even if it's evil, the question is, well, why is it evil? And that why evil points to the greater truth of what's needed to actually address it. Oh. It's not about destroying it, it's about addressing it. Healing. Healing. Mm-hmm. But only truth can reveal that to you. But if you say that's good and this is evil, then what happens? We get rid of evil and we start, it's like we become very attached to seeking good and we want to destroy anything that's evil. But we don't really understand why it's evil. It's kind of like trans, the definition of transcendence you shared where you're just trying to escape it or yeah. shut it down, but it takes process often. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and so that's why for me, everything, what brings life to every situation? What brings life? That's when we're doing that, that's, we're eating from the tree of life. And there is no place for judgment there. Mm-hmm. And if there is judgment, I'm really curious, why is it here? What's the truth of it? Well, in a way, that is, well, I mean, that is what leads to us leaving the Garden of Eden, which is, you know, a place of peace, of abundance, of connection to God. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's described as being uh, a situation where they're kicked out. Yeah. But really, it's they they leave. I think they choose to leave in the story actually they because they think God doesn't want us anymore because we're yeah or can't have us anymore because we're we are now we have to be covered up. We have to hide. God's a fearful thing hmm. in that story, which is really interesting. That and that's what happens when we lose our trust in God. We we become very fearful. When often the appearance, yeah, we feel like God has kicked us out, yeah. but we've actually created the distance. Yeah. I, I noticed that in the Bible and Scripture, often it's it's almost like describing the appearance of things, but if you pay attention, you can see that the deeper thread. Right. Huh. Right. Now, 
Do, do you find that in, in scripture as well? And do you, do you often use scripture in your, your teaching too, your sermons? And, well, I, well, I find, if anything, I've become more scriptural and, uh, since I've become part of the Diamond School. Oh, really? Um, partly because I now see the experiences which are driving the scriptures, the truth behind them. Yeah. Like the fact of why we say the truth sets us free. What, what's the meaning of that? But so, so all the stories now, I think, in the Bible have a lot more meaning to me than they used to before. And, not, and now it's not just literal now. It's, well, it's not literal, but it's, it's definitely, it's far more experiential. Yeah. You know, uh, things, you know, there's so many truths in the Bible that just resonate so much deeper for me now. Uh, you know. Um, kind of like how it, it says Jesus or Christ always talked in parable. Those parables have deep meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, often I find, well, the story you just related, or the seven-day creation story, etc. Right. Um, they're they're similar type of parables. Often, are really speaking to our hearts, and you know, illuminating paths to growth. In a sense. Yeah, and I, I think like, healing. And, and 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 there's so many parables and metaphors, which you know, like lightness and darkness. You know, um, the issues around judgment. Like it's interesting how the Pharisees and religious leaders are seen as almost like a religious foil against what Jesus is, you know. And so you see all the issues of judgment everywhere in the text, mm -hmm. and how that judgment gets in the way of people experiencing God, right? And and, and then you see in Jesus something very very different, yeah, right? You know, um, you know, and it's it's almost like every turn to Jesus, every turn Jesus is constantly crossing boundaries. And breaking through these barriers which society was creating regarding who's in and who's out. Well, Jesus is constantly crossing those boundaries, both within socially, but also like even within our, even within the soul, right? Helping people realize, no, you are not bad people. You know, even to the thief on the cross, Jesus said to him, you know, you will be in the paradise after all. Hmm. You're saying, so great. how can that be? Because he's done some bad things, but in that moment, he saw the truth. He saw who he really was in God's eyes. And Jesus saw that too. Yeah, you, you know, this Good Samaritan story. Yeah. You, know, you have Jesus relating and asking at the end, you know, who was the neighbor? And it's this individual that the people around him would have dismissed or, you know, viewed as an outcast, as, as the wrong kind of Jew, essentially. Right. Um, and it's, yeah, good point around. Well, and, and, and with that parable, that parable has many different meanings. We, yeah. there, there's the social meaning, what you're describing, but who is our neighbor when we look into our eternal, into our eternal part? Our enemies often these negative things we want to judge. Yeah, the neighbor's yeah. good. Right, and, and it turns out the neighbor is actually this, that anxiety is actually your neighbor you need to respect and love and take care of. Huh. Because it points us to what, to what needs to be addressed. But so, if, yeah, what can be used for, it can be used for good. Exactly. So that, that's, that story of the Good Samaritan helps you see that what we think often we judge as bad, mm. we need to hold totally differently because it may be actually the source of our way home. Yeah, that's quite insightful. So I tend to see stories, I, also, I interpret those parables or stories both in the outside world, but also in the internal world. And that's why the, the role of symbols and metaphors are really powerful. Yeah. You know, like blind man, right? Blind and you shall see without blind. The thing with blindness has many different meanings. Right? It, it could be physical blindness, but as that text talk, points directly, it talks about spiritual blindness. Spiritual. Uh, all over the place, right? The, uh, the Swedenborg Foundation um, is uh, tasked with sharing Swedenborg's writings and uh, continuing his uh, legacy of the theological reflection. Uh, but also his, his openness. He, he believed there were many paths to God. But a lot of his texts uh, that the, the foundation uh, publishes are, are centered around this idea that Scripture has a spiritual meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and very, a very deep meaning for, for our life. And it, it has real corollaries to, to how we live and, and how our soul works. Right. It sounds like you, you have a similar type of idea around yeah, I use scriptures far more metaphorically um, and that than I probably ever have in the past, but it, it still has a literal feel to it. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it has 
it's almost hard leaves to describe. it in a way, like a skin. Or yeah, a it's, body. It's, but it's not literal in the sense that, in the sense of word for word, you know, that way. But it's but every word has meaning to it. I guess I would say. And, and I look for yeah. the deep meaning of all the words, and it's amazing how they speak, they can speak to us, right? So even you know, I, I don't throw away text very easily. No. Even difficult no. texts, I think, are quite can be quite rich. You you mentioned focusing on the meaning of words, and I I've been reflecting on how scripture often has names that are actually meanings that they they tend to have. A meaning behind them in our English translations, um, at least in the part that you typically read, mm -hmm. they often don't translate those names into those meanings. But when when I reflected on those meanings through those verses, the the verse tends to come alive a little bit more because you you or I, I start to see this kind of deeper metaphor within mm -hmm. even the names of things in Scripture. How, how does that relate to, to your spiritual practice and uh, just reading scripture and focusing on, on the deeper meaning of the words? Well, um, oh, that's boy, that's an interesting question. I think of the I am, which is at the base of Yahweh, right? I am. And, uh, and the I am experience. And for me, I unpack that because there's an I and there's an M. Hmm. There, you know, there's an I that's doing the experiencing and there's an M which is the experience, but together they make up the experience of God. I am, which is presence. I've come to realize that's the same as presence. You're very present. I'm here, but there's also, I'm very much aware of the M experience. And I can't distinguish what's me and what's the experience. Hmm. That's the I am experience. That's also when I experience God. That's what God, that's what experience God is like. That sense of presence so profound. So that's what I want, that's, for me, that's, that's unpacking one word, I am. Yeah. <laughs> right into something, wow, this is the essence. And it's, and it's interesting how the Jewish tradition says we can't say that word. It, 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 mm -hmm. The other is unspeakable. Mm -hmm. and, and you think, well, that's true, because as soon as we try to speak, we try to name it and then we try to control it and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's best for us just to experience presence. Because we know what it is when we have it and we're experiencing it. And the name of sort of takes away the mystery of it. Well, scripture often talks about the one who comes in the name of God or, mm -hmm. uh, and, or something around the name of God. But scripture also has many different names for God. Yes. So in a sense, it's the name of God is something bigger than a specific pronunciation. True mm -hmm. enough. And it points to different experiences. I think in Islam, they have what, 100 names for God, I think, or 99 names? Yeah, that's the famous. But I think there's more, actually, yeah. in the Quran, in, in the Muslim it's tradition. It's yeah. And those names, I think, are all important. They help us capture another aspect of God that we can easily ignore if we just use one name. Okay? Yeah. That's why it's beautiful to use different names for God. I see my prayers. You know, I know for me, I'm tempted to use Lord all the time, but I know for some people, they don't experience Lord in a very positive way. So it's good to use other words to capture other aspects. Right? Yeah. Well, I notice some people use phrases like the universe yeah. when they're talking about what I would identify as God. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I shouldn't need to, to change their their lingo because it's healthy for them. They may have baggage towards mm -hmm. uh, God. Well, I, I don't know if you know the, the Celtic tradition, Philip Newell, but he uses the word life for God. Life. And he's totally reworked the whole t um, Lord's Prayer in a way which is so rich. Oh, really? And uh, you should look it up sometime, but it's quite profound and I don't and you know, if he, like he moves away from fa Happy Father and all that into, but these images just it just deepens it so much more. And it's and it, this is a prayer anyone could pray, but it, it touches deeply. At least when I read it, I go, wow. Yeah, it resonates with me what you said before about like limiting the idea of God in our heads sometimes limits how we can approach God. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly, you have, you have this this uh, perspective that there is healing to be done from the more destructive things. So it's not necessarily that God is in the evil, but that the evil can be used for, for good. Um, I'm, I'm curious, could you explore the idea of, of opening our idea of God um, and, and ground it in, in healing, if you, if you will? 
Wow. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really trying to transcend my inner scene. I right get now. you. I'm to... <laughs> well, I think it's important to see, like the way I've come, to, I see God as the transforming healing agent within every aspect of life. Yeah. Right? That's what I've come to see. And, and when there is something painful going on, when there's some evil going on, that tells you there's some block going on. Some block, whether it's within ourselves, what we call an ego, an ego structure or a structure within society, which is interfering or blocking the flow of God's Spirit to do what it wants to do. Hmm. That's how I tend to understand it. That's and, great. And, and so therefore, when we see things that are not working well in the world, that tells you there's something blocking God's Spirit from what it wants to do. Right, and so that's and and that's why I think we we sense pulls within us to get involved and try to bring about change around justice and healing and and peace and so on because we feel there's something wrong. That pull inside is God's spirit pulling us to work at the change that needs to happen here. So that's how I tend I, I tend to work at it. Right. Yeah. Now there's things in life which are really hard to explain. Mm. Right. There's you know not everything can be explained quite this way. But there's you know. There's an aspect, like for example, I look at my brothers who died of AIDS. Well, it wasn't their fault they died of AIDS. Like they were taking blood products, which we all thought were good, but they weren't good. You know, and so there's, there's a sense, I find at times, there's a sense, there's a, how to describe it, there's a chaotic aspect of life that we somehow have to get our heads around. It's just part of life. And, it, and yet I see a value to chaos in the sense that chaos is what keeps things I'm becoming too structured, <laughs> right? It's almost like it's necessary to soften us. I don't know. So there's a bit of a mystery I have around s some aspects of what what is wrong with our world. It's not all around things being structured wrong. There's other things. There's there's, there's a chaotic aspect of life which is hard to get my head around sometimes. Well, what I do know is is that when difficult things happen, like with my brother and the HIV AIDS and them dying. Those moments of chaos were moments where I experienced God very profoundly. Hmm. And, and, and they helped me, they transformed that pain in me towards my brothers and, and their loss. And I remember when my first brother died, I was, in, I was numb. I was numb for, oh, I remember preaching a sermon. I was, just, I was a student pastor and I remember preaching a sermon, I think about a month before he died. And I, was, I, I preached where I was that, at that time. I was really struggling. I was angry at God. So I preached a sermon on my anger at God. Hmm. And I remember that Tuesday, I got taken out by someone in the church who scolded me <laughs> for, for, as a pastor, teaching about being angry at God. Pastors should never be angry at God, I was, he told me, right? And I was a little devastated until my supervisor um, connected with me. He said, Cord, don't worry about it. There's lots of people in the Bible who are angry at God. You're in good company. <laughs> right, all the prophets were angry at God, <laughs> right? But that was a really core experience for me. But I was angry, and then when my brother died three yeah. four weeks later, I became totally numb. Wow. And then my my dad wanted to have four visitations, you know, and we knew they were gonna be big ones, and they were big ones. A lot of tons of people came to my parents' hometown church and came to the visitation, and I, you know, I and I just I was numb. I just just plotted my way through them, just coping, just coping, just coping. And then the day of the funeral, you know, and the tradition in our family is is that the family walks into the very end. So everybody's in there, already in their church, in the pews, and the family walks in. And so I remember walking in, and I was totally not just wanting to get this day over with. And I remember walking in, and I saw a church full of 200, 250 people just crying, just in tears. And I saw those tears. And then they hit me. Those tears is God crying with me. Oh. And as soon as I, I made that connection, all of a sudden I began to cry. And that became a holy moment and that whole service became a holy service. And it just shifted my whole experience of that death and future death since then. Um, and I realized then that, wow, God can be, in, is God's in the midst of every single experience in life, no matter, no matter regardless how painful it is. And the key thing is to be open to God's Spirit being present there. And I wasn't until I saw all those people crying. And all of a sudden, the, my heart opened and then I began to cry. Um, and then that, and that really shifted. And that was the beginning of me 
no longer asking the why question. That's incredible. Because I before that I did a lot of work around asking the why question and running groups around why questions and uh, trying to make sense of it. Um, but it shifted my why question discussion because I realized I'm not sure it's important anymore. What's important is that God is with us in the midst of every experience. We may not experience it, and that's something we're curious about. Yeah. Right? Because that's there's something within you that's getting away of that God Spirit actually touching your heart on the God. And that's what I'm curious about, because that's what people need. And that's why when that lady said, Help me how to pray, that's what that means. Mm. How do I help people experience God's presence in the midst of whatever they're going through? It's quite powerful. Your story. Thank you for sharing. So that's, you know, that's why the, the, the question of where's God and everything, you know, from the question you were asking, the issues around evil and that, well, mm-hmm. I believe God's so very much at work trying to ch- shift that. But when there's evil happening, there's so many structures in place which is getting away of that. Mm-hmm. Getting away of God's spirit trying to bring about change. And that's what, and that's why we feel anger at that stuff. Why God, why we're pulled to begin to find ways to address it. Yeah, it's interesting how our freedom and our limitations play a role in, in, in what you just described, at least from, from my perspective. Yeah. And how, uh, you know, often we can learn from those traumatic moments that can be used for good. Mm-hmm. And they, they probably all are. Um, but it's sometimes hard to find that. I mean, it's hard to see why it would be necessary to be used for good uh, without, at least for me, reflecting on what must be a necessity around human freedom. Um, you know, God's well, love for us to have our own autonomy. Yeah. You know, and I, and I remember like that experience around my first brother's death. It was a dramatic one for us, traumatic for us as a family and for my parents. You know, and. And I remember my, my parents phoning me up. It was about, Jamie died in August. My parents had phoned me up in January the following year. And they were really struggling. Which, and we were all struggling, even despite my experience. We were all struggling to some extent, but they were really struggling. And I remember they phoned me up and asking permission, you know, Gord, we'd like to adopt a boy. Hmm. And since I heard that, I said, oh no. They're, they want to adopt a boy to, to replace my brother. And I says, that wouldn't be fair for any boy to come into our family with that type of pressure. And, 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 I, and, and, and I reflect a little bit to my parent, but, but then I got this brainwave. It came out of the blue, I said, I said, Dad, why don't you become a big brother? Right? And Mom, you always wanted to have a daughter. Why don't you become a big sister to a big well, they heard me, and they end up becoming. Dad became a big brother, and then you know he became a big brother to a boy whose father died of AIDS. Oh, really? And mom became a big sister to a, a girl who didn't have, who didn't, um, you know, who needed another person in her life. And so it was, those are really significant relationships for my parents, and uh, it helped them process or find meaning yeah. in the death of my my youngest brother. Well, you know, I, I think there's, there's still a journey for, for all of us around the death of my brothers, but those are, those are definitely some healing aspects that happen for us. Well, it's quite, I'm sure it's quite difficult even, even today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was, well, I think we're at different places. I think mom and dad are still feel a lot of, you know, they still feel lost in their brothers deeply, and I understand that. They were parents. And you mentioned chaos before and how often we, we see it in um, you know, folks getting diseases or dying from, uh, you know, whatever, a natural disaster. And I, I guess for me, like, this idea of human freedom transcends humanity. It's almost like creation itself has like a chaotic bend to it, but that allows for greater healing or growth over time. So it's almost like this... The, the tendency of the human spirit to have a freedom to destroy is also present in, in a, maybe a more mundane way, but in, in every atom, the world around us. Uh, but I think 
you know, often we grapple for, for reasons why, but you, you mentioned that question doesn't necessarily concern you. Well, in it, the same way, it does. It does. I don't think any answer will make us happy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I think that's what it comes down. Like I can sit here and rationalize, and I can see that I can see the gift of chaos. Yeah. Intellectually, I can. Mm-hmm. Because the gift of chaos is what makes new creation possible. Mm-hmm. From the old comes new. Well, how does that happen? The chaos breaks down the old, so something new can arise. So intellectually, it makes total sense. Mm-hmm. But for the people going through it, it's torture. Yeah. It's painful. It's trauma. But what I do realize is, do know that in the midst of that torture and painful, it's, it's possible to experience God's presence, and that can become very special and meaningful. And that's what allows us to be with those painful places in a different way. So you know, it feels chaotic. Looking back after, like, you know, I look back now and I'm thinking, I, the part of me says, I would never say that I wish my, I'm glad my brother stopped. I would never say that. Yeah. Because it's not true. But, I can also say that I look back and say, wow, God has brought so much good out of that painful situation, this painful situation, it just marvels to me. Mm. Right. And it brings a whole meaning to that you know, text in Romans 8 where it says, you know, God works together in everything, bringing the good out of all things which are bad or something like that. In Romans 8, there's a text that talks about that. Mm. And that text just comes to life for me when I think about my life and I see in other people's lives when they look back and the goodness that come out of some certain situation it's amazing how God's spirit can bring about transformation and healing yeah. right it's it's amazing. it is and it just it's during awesome days like the other days I you know, you sit there, you know you're in the midst of processing other painful experiences oh man you wish it wasn't the case yeah but then you begin to pray with it hold it and ask God to be with you in this experience and be open to how God's spirit might be working, and all of a sudden, shifts start happening. You know, all of a sudden, you begin to see meaning, you see purpose, and you see love and compassion arising in yourself and others. And, and that is such a better place to be than to get caught up. And I think what this is a challenge is it's easy to get caught up in the why and the anger, and as a result, get really bitter towards self. It's really easy to do that. Yeah. And, and to become defensive towards the why. That's right. Because you know, or attached to the why and become very and, and very angry that there is there's no answer and so on. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And compassion you mentioned a couple of times, but that's so powerful, compassion. I mean how it can arise from traumatic situations for for you know, yourself or other people in similar situations. It's it's interesting that uh, trauma can harden the heart, but it can also Soften. Serve them to soften. Right. Hmm. Yeah, it can go both ways. Yeah. And in my work is 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 to understand the dynamic. It's natural for the heart to harden it's the trauma. Yeah. I think that's the natural defense mechanism. But to the support and care of other people and with God's spirit, the other the other can happen too. Well, it's also a call for compassion for people going through trauma. Right. You know. People should never go through trauma at all. Yeah. It, it's just too hard. It's just too hard. That's why they need others to surround them. And, and that surrounding, I think, is part of God's spirit at work, trying to bring mm-hmm. about healing and softness to us so we can experience other aspects or other aspects of God's spirit in this that way be compassion, tenderness. Mm-hmm. With trauma, there is definitely need to experience a lot of anger and hate. That's part of the process of journey of healing. You gotta create space for that. Yeah, you that can't takes just a shut it down. Yeah. That takes a special people to hold that, yeah. that that anger and hate. But that's what's needed because there is a lot of that there, which is why the trauma is there. Yeah. And as they're able to find a place to process that anger and hate and begin to get understand the truth behind it and feel it validated, then it shifts begin to happen. And they begin to let go of something they thought they could never let go of. That's incredible. That's the journey. That's really the journey of resurrection. Hmm. You think about it, right? It's we have to die to that which is broken. Die to that which is broken. Broken. It's meaning that yeah. we often become very attached to it and it becomes part of our identity. Hmm. 
and and but the dying is, is is actually allowing being around people who allow you to be with the pain and the hate and the anger around you. And 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 as that is able to is validated, all of a sudden you begin to hold that pain a little looser. Hmm. Which then allows something else to begin to emerge. Yeah. And what begins to emerge is the beginning of the resurrection. Otherwise we're caught in hell. Sorry, one second. I'm gonna ask you to repeat that. I thought I did the To repeat that thought and then emerge. Why is it too? Yeah, well, it's it's really important for a person who's gone through trauma to have people around them um, who allows them to be with all the pain, with that pain becomes the hate and the anger. Because if they're not able to have people around them, they will become even more attached to the pain, the trauma. But if they have people around them who's able to allow them to experience it, to voice it, to have that experience validated, that validation, knowing there's someone around them who actually gets it, allows them to begin to release the pain. They're to release their grip on the pain and allows something new to arise within them. Hmm. That is the beginning of the resurrection. When you're totally attached, connected, you're really in a place of hell. That's a good Friday experience, the place of hell. Like you're detached, there's no hope, there's no way to ever change. But when, you're, when that experience is able to be validated and really empathize with someone around them or a few around them, they're able to hold it differently and allow something new to arise. And that's the beginning of the resurrection. When you begin to say, oh, maybe I'm not this trauma. Maybe this is not all of life. And suddenly they begin to experience other aspects of God's spirit within them. And they can begin to claim that as this is who I am, not that trauma experience. And so that's the journey of the resurrection, as I understand it anyway, um, um, for us yeah. here who've gone through trauma. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Yeah. It's a, you mentioned community and how that can be very helpful in, in the process. Well, for people going through a lot of difficult experiences, you, get, you can't do it by yourself. I think it's a myth that we can live life by ourselves. Um, yeah. You know, it's easy to live joy by our joys and fun times by ourselves, although they're far more fun to share with people too. But when you're going through difficult experiences, you need people around you to to share to share that with you, to can walk with you, who can empathize with you, um, who can be with you in the trenches. Um, and I think that's part of the gift of spiritual direction because I find I'm with that person for many people. I certainly yeah. was that person many people when I was going through the age crisis and when I was visiting people, I was that person. There was a ton of people who needed a person like myself. But we need mm. communities like that. I think that's the role of the church, actually. Mm. Yeah. Communities who are able to hold um, the experience that people have in life so they're able to experience God in the midst of life. I think it's probably the best definition of church I can think of. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Kind of an open, an open definition. Yeah. Makes sense. Right. And it doesn't mean you have all the answers in church. These, like I said, these why questions I think can't be answered. But we can do things in church which allows people to feel held and allows people to surrender whatever their experience is to God and allow God to listen to them, whether it be through music. Mm -hmm. Through the songs we sing, through the songs we listen to, through through sermons which help people actually learn how to hold their experience in ways which is more spacious and consider how God may be ministering in this situation, that situation in their life. You know, through 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 poems of prayer which help us to really center ourselves and and center ourselves where we're not we're not lost in the problem, but actually like separate from it. Mm -hmm. In many ways, I think that's the goal, uh, purpose of prayer in many ways is to help us hold our life experiences in a way that they're not us. That we're here and this is this is what I'm going through, God. I'm going through this experience and that experience. Help me. Well that act, act of prayer is putting what used to be part of our identity out here for God to minister to. Hmm. Hmm. And that helps us hold these things lighter. They're not us. They're part of our life experience, but they're not us. And I think hmm. I think that's what the purpose of prayer is to help create that space and as a result then we see God able to minister 
to our life experience in a whole different way. Yeah, they're not us, but often we, we identify with them. And even though we may think we want to let it go, we, it's how we define ourselves often. Through, right. Through our life experiences. Yeah, life experiences through yeah. certain habits sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the structures we tend to have in life, the habits, our behavior patterns. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some have kind of served a purpose to console us maybe when we were younger or, mm -hmm. or they were constructed for whatever reason. And some still work. Some still and some, serve that purpose. And some still work so well. Yeah. But there, it sounds like there's always room for, for more transformation and allowing God to... Well, you, you mentioned it before, allowing God's will to further manifest itself. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that's a constant journey. And, and when I say that, I, I don't want to... To, to create the idea that we're on this, you know, a journey of should, 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 should. I, I, it's more a journey of, at least for me, it, I'm. It's more a journey of curiosity. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, where is God going to take me now? Like, where is God? How's God at work in here? And how's God at work here? Like, and I'm just trying to be open. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to just to be open and to follow where I sense I'm being led. You know, I, I think, yeah. and that's very different than a list of shifts. Well, God is really big. Yeah. As you were alluding to, all those wonderful qualities in our lives of our divinity, you know, yeah. and They're our, part of our us. spirit, part of us. Yeah. So growing towards those things, it, yeah, it's not like a, a set in stone type of experience. But and it's less about growing toward them and, and, and basically trying to find ways, which is beginning to move to a side, move aside that which is getting in the way of them arising. Right. Yeah, yeah, which is a little different. Yeah, they're already there. How can I help them blossom a little more? Yeah, God's always with us, but we're not always with God to our full extent. Right. right. And that's the journey. Well, and that's not meant to be a guilt trip. That's just, that's the journey, man. Yeah, that's, that is the journey. <laughs> <laughs> trying, yeah. Trying to transcend our idiocy, if I can say it one more time. Mm -hmm. But I, honestly, I feel like it's a never-ending journey. But maybe it doesn't have to always have so many pitfalls, right? So many yeah. destructive things, you think? That's true. Like I, I think the key thing, like I the key thing for me is to realize how to describe it. I think once you realize your your identity as a child of God, like once that shift has happened, which can happen pretty early in people's lives. That really creates a huge shift within us, I think, because no longer are we concerned about our destiny. No longer are we concerned about um, whether we're God's children or not. That's never in doubt anymore. Yeah. We know our who we are. And, there's, and, it's, and since we know who we are, we know we're, who we are and where we're going. We know everything. We sense God is with us. Yeah. Um, and so there's never that, that question of doubt about who we are disappears for our destiny. It just, just goes off, the, goes off, falls off the radar. And now the journey becomes, well, how do I explain some more of this? <laughs> very yeah, different. That is different. Very different. But that first part, the knowing that your God's child is, is a key piece. And you know, and, 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 that, and that's and that, that's a challenging one because I, you know, I know people who who struggle with that, but they never get to that place where they, where it settles. Mm -hmm. Where they feel they can rest in, in the assurance that yes, I am a child of God. Or it's and sustainable. It's, it's sustainable. It doesn't mean that your life is perfect. Yeah. But you just know in your core that, oh, yeah, I am I am a child of God, and God it does care for me, does love me. That is never in question. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean your life is perfect. It doesn't mean you don't forget about that. You know, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you get lost in this and this. But when you become centered, when you become back, become more centered, you're like, oh, yeah, right. I am God. It, it, you reconnect again with that. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's getting people to that place. You know, and that's why I think, yeah, I think there is there is a place of you know where at least for many of us we do need a fairly significant experience for for that for that sense of root rootedness to take place, the sense that we are God's child. Like I know you shared with me part of your journey, mm -hmm. and I would think part of that shift that happened for you, mm -hmm. that experience that led to you knowing inside that yeah, and that, that just shifts in how you hold your life and how you see so you're no longer hiding from God in the same way. Yeah. Right. It, that's that's no longer the issue anymore. Now you're trying to how do I experience more of that? That's the journey now for you and I. But for others, I know it's just, it's getting it's making that transition, 
And I think that's the, you know, how to have those core experiences which break that shift is kind of important for this. I know some people are like, to the day that I die, am I saved or not? Hmm. And you know, I, I would love to be with meet with some of those people, but I think there must be a way to work at that. But what is the blockage that gets in the way of them actually claiming who they are? Who we're born, uh, yeah. who, who, we, who they are, who, who were born to be right from day one, and somehow they lost they lost touch with that. And that's the journey for them is to reconnect with the sense of who they are hmm. beyond their history. And often it's it's almost the history of generations. Um, it would take the history of generations to tell the story of why we're often the, the way we are. Because mm -hmm. we get inherited tendencies, we have our childhood environments. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like a lot to unpack. Yeah. But God's always there. And, ready but, and but who are we are? Who are we beyond that? Yeah. Right, that's that's the question I think it's important for people to be with. Who are you beyond your history? Yeah. Because there's times we experience ourselves. Like we're in the present moment. There is no history. Hmm. When we're experiencing God's presence, there is no history. There's just me and God, and it's it's peaceful, it's joyful, it's calm. There's times I feel really strong, really powerful. Hmm. When you're in the present moment, there is no history. And which yeah. means your sense of who you are is not tied to history. It's tied to the present moment and your relationship with God. So coming back to the present moment is really powerful. It's really powerful. It's key. It's, yeah. it's, it's why I guess probably that's the purpose of prayer. Is to help us come back to the present moment. Be very careful. Which when we're prayerful, we are moving to the present moment. Well let's let's sit on this idea of, of presence maybe to end. Because you mentioned before um, uplifting spiritual practices that help people come to the present moment is a big part of your spiritual direction. Uh, could you share with us some ways that we can come uh, back into the present moment uh, and uh, maybe practices that transcend one religiosity but can apply to, to most of our lives? Well, personally, I, I'm a, a big, um, what do you call it? Centering prayer meditator, mm -hmm. right? It's something that the Diamond Approach really pushed, but the reality that's in our own Christian tradition too, centering prayer, um, where you set aside, you know, 20, 25 minutes every day. For me, it's in the morning. You know, where you where you just sit sit on the couch, where I just sit on the couch and just practice being centered, present, I'm totally present in my experience. You know, and. And just be there as much as I can. And when your mind gets distracted, you just say, oh, returning home. Home being here, your center is your, the belly, your belly button, the bottom of your gut. You just keep returning home. And when you return home, you just be with your experience. Hmm. You just keep doing that over and over again for 25 minutes. And just learn to be with your experience. And you be with everything that's there. You be with tiredness. You be with doubt. You be with whatever experience. You don't push nothing away. All you're trying to do is just be with your experience. And, and, and as you do that, you'll find yourself settling. You'll find yourself over time settling. You'll find yourself with a sense of surrender going on inside. You should, that's what you're just being. You're not trying to make anything happen. You're just being with it and just allowing things to happen. And your body, your soul naturally wants to surrender. Just be. Now the mind says, oh, it wants to go over the map. And you call this monkey mind. Yeah. Right? Mind wants to go here. And everywhere your mind goes, it often triggers experiences. So you have to catch yourself and you bring yourself back home. And oh well, that's interesting. I'm the mind took me there, took me here, but you keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's, it's it's a really important practice of learning to come home. Right? That's really what saying prayer is about. It's learning to come home to your center. It's not staying in your center, it's learning to come home to your center. I think that's the most important part of the practice is coming home. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I say that is oh. because once you learn to come home, you end, you end, up, you end up staying home more often. But what happens is once you learn to come home, you will find that throughout the day, you will have coming home experiences. <laughs> because you have practiced for 20, 25 minutes coming home, just being present. And all of a sudden, well, you're here, and all of a sudden, you see the sun, you realize you're present. You just came home. And so you linger there longer. 
and then you're, you're and, and maybe a few minutes later, something will happen. All of a sudden, you, you just woke up. You're present. You linger there longer because you recognize the experiences of coming home throughout the day, and you linger every time it happens. Hmm. Which deepens the experience. Or you find yourself. I find one reason I like spiritual direction because I find that is that is essentially one hour of being totally centered for me. Yeah. Because I'm totally centered and just holding your experience and listening to it too. And then me sharing what comes to me as I listen to you. Mm-hmm. It's one hour of centering therapy. Because I'm totally centered. And cool. and, 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 and at times I catch myself with certain certain directees, it's not quite the case. You know, and I find I'm not centered because of the, of the dynamic between us and I realize what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Well that's part of my journey of Okay, I gotta unpack this so I can help them unpack theirs. Yeah. Right? Um, but that's part of the journey of being a spiritual director. But yeah. but anyway, that, and that's and to me that the whole mindfulness, I prefer I rather call it prayerfulness practice of centering prayer, is to me is really key. Um, mm. and then I think another one is I think uh, contemplating scripture is another big one. You know, we each have our scriptures, you know, we yeah. Christians have the Bible. Jews have their scriptures, and like we all have our scriptures. Even the Buddhists have scriptures, and and I stress contemplating. I, I think there's a place for studying scriptures to understand it, but I also think there's a place for contemplating scripture, which I have found really useful. When you contemplate scripture, you allow scripture to speak to you as you read it, hmm. meaning you're not trying to figure it out now with your mind. Like studying is all about figuring out scripture and what it's trying to say, and there's a value for that. But when you're contemplating scripture, you're really becoming actually very present to scripture. You're centering on the scripture and practicing centering prayer with it and allowing the scripture to speak to us. And when I do that with scripture, that's when I discover that the texts become alive. All of a sudden, words no longer, words are not just words on a page. They now have, every word is like a symbol and point to deeper meaning. And contemplating scripture does that. It helps you go beyond the surface to the deeper meaning of text. And all of a sudden, our scriptures speak to us in ways we never, never used to speak to us. That's great. Yeah, so that's, oh. what, that's, contemplate, that's what contemplating scripture, and there's many different ways to do that. Mm-hmm. But that's, yeah, that's another key practice. I think uh, nature is another big one. Yeah. Right? Uh, Type of scripture. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, the nature we experience connection. Mm-hmm. Right? And... It's interesting, and that sense of connection, I think, helps us experience connection in other parts of our life. Mm-hmm. It's a place where we can, probably nature is a place where we, where we can actually become present the easiest in nature. Um, I think studies show that. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I'm a big kayaker, I'm a, you know, a hiker, I love nature. Um, hmm. Music's another big one. Yeah. Right. You know, here at this church, our church, Menai Church of Fort, they sing four part harmony a lot. Music's a oh, big part of wow. Menai tradition. And so I use music a lot to help people experience presence and prayerfulness, uh, to help experience some of these moments where we go in. Rather than transcend, we try to, you know, during my congregational prayer, I may use music to help us experience God in the midst of being in the trench around something, right? Hmm. Whether it be a grief or whether Whatever it is, you know, last week I focused on the idea of an anagram. I did an anagram last Sunday, and I just talked briefly about the nine different ways we become lost. Each type is a way we become lost. Oh. And so the prayer time was all about coming together as lost people and hearing the song, Nothing is Lost in the Breath of God. Nothing. Powerful song. Mm-hmm. But even in the sense that we'll get lost in, our, in the weakness of our type, we're never lost in that sense. The kind of musical reflection. Yeah, and so it helps people experience through music the essence of God's presence mm. in a time when we easily can get totally identified with our losses and think there is no. Yeah. Right. So the things like that I play with here. That's great. With music, just to help us experience those core, what I call correctional emotional experiences, which help us heal some of the, some of the trauma and pain in our life. Maybe one day I'll get a, uh, a replacement preacher for my church. Not fun. <laughs> Sounds fun. No, we have a reflective musical time too. Oh, I'm sure you really do. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure you that's do. Great. And that's like one of the purposes of it. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. Well, music for so many people is it's just so emotive. It's often a way that we can get connected with our feelings and um, feel a type of assurance. I think it's often yeah. it's often hard to put into words. Well, and the reason it does that is because it helps us move into the present moment. Mm-hmm. Music does that. 
Um, right, that's that's it. that's its power. That's that's wonderful. Well, this has been quite a joy, uh, Gloria. Thank you for for sharing and coming on to the, the show. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. And I I, I hope you all get uh, as much as I just did from this conversation. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us anytime, share your thoughts, your feedback, uh, what you're going through. Uh, and uh, we uh, want to uplift you wherever you're at. Uh, so, so don't be a stranger. And I, I appreciate you not being a stranger at all, Gord, and being such a wonderful spiritual director uh, to me as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, well, bye folks and go forth knowing that you are quite loved. God's blessing.